Welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that together, with our communities of place and of purpose, we can make this happen. I'm Manda Scott, and I spent the first series of this podcast laying out the basic toolkit that we think is essential to making conscious evolution a possibility, which is the entire premise behind the whole Accidental Gods project this podcast, the website, and the membership program that lies behind it. Since then, we've been exploring that extraordinary, inspiring intersection where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, from which we can craft a vision of a future that is generative for all of us, for the human and the more-than-human worlds. My guest this week is someone who devotes her whole life to that way of creating generation. Jill Coombs is a writer, facilitator, and an elder of Extinction Rebellion. In our first conversation together, we spoke about hearing our calling and the questions that we might ask ourselves that would help us find a path that would nourish us and all around us on all levels. At the time, I had read Jill's second book, which is called The Game, and wanted to talk about it in more depth. So this podcast is based around that book and her metaphor of life as a game with seven avatars that we can choose to play. As we say in the podcast, all seven of these run through each of us, and we can occupy any of them, one or more than one, at any given moment. They are a fascinating lens through which to view the world, and it seems to me that anything which offers us a way of being more aware, of making choice, of having agency, is a good thing. So, people of the podcast, please welcome once again Jill Coombs. So, Jill Coombs, for our second podcast together, welcome back to Accidental Gods. I gather you've moved since the last time. You have such an interesting peripatetic lifestyle. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you're living at the moment? Yeah, I'm house-sitting my way around the country at the moment. Uh, My partner and I sold the house last November and decided that we would just float for a bit. It felt intuitively right in a time that feels very fluid and unsettled. So uh, we weren't anticipating COVID, of course, but then nobody was. (laughs) But since then, we have been mostly house-sitting our way around the Cotswolds in the southwest. And right now I'm in the uh, Blackmore Vale in Dorset. Wow. And you're finding the places to house sit on a on a website that does long term house sits for people who want you to come and look after the dogs and the cats and the chickens and the bees and anything else that they have exactly. rather than just leaving the house empty. Yeah, exactly that. Uh, there are almost always animals of some sort involved. Unfortunately, they're not always long term sits. They can be anything from one night up to three months, mm. typically. So uh, guess getting long sits at the moment is a challenge, as you can imagine, mm. people. And mm. also sits are appearing at very short notice. So fortunately, both Peter and I have a very high tolerance for uncertainty, which is which is useful at the moment. And, and leaves me shaking with terror. I have a very <laughs> low tolerance for uncertainty. So I'm very impressed. And during lockdown, people were away and just chose to stay away so that you had somewhere to live. Uh, at the beginning of lockdown, before it locked right down, uh, we stayed in the house of a French couple who just about managed to make it to France and back to see family before total lockdown. And right. I was very fortunate during actual lockdown that a, a dear friend said, well, I have a house that's empty at the moment uh, because mm. we're locking down with my mother in the north of the country. So if you want right. to use it, just use it for as long as you want to, which gave wow. us two months to just relax and, and be there, which I was so grateful for. Right. Yes. And I heard we're recording now, middle of September. Uh-huh. Um, we had a conversation with someone who's involved with Pricewaterhouse Cooper, strangely enough, and they are completely closing their entire Manchester multiple huge, big, super luxury tower block at a saving of half a billion pounds. Hmm. I don't know over what time span. And everybody, apparently, this was in the context of trying to find somewhere for a relative to live in Shrewsbury. And the estate agents that normally have two to three hundred houses on their books have six. 
because people from Manchester are looking at Shrewsbury as this is the country. We're all going to move to the country. Um, and house prices are doing weird things. People are buying things unseen off the internet, which is, you know, in, in normal times, you would consider to be functionally insane, frankly. Mm. Um, and it's it's going to change the whole nature of our culture. Um, so being peripatetic at this point, and, and presumably if you found somewhere you wanted to buy, you would buy it, seems to me a very interesting and flexible, and you can float on the surface of all these changes and then settle when, when the time is right. Because who knows what's going to happen? I think the person we were talking to said the housing problem, the inner city housing problem, is going to be solved because there's going to be so much office space, which will have to be turned into housing because, frankly, what else are you going to do with it? So that's an interesting thing. But it does mean that the people with money who have been living in cities but not wanting to are all moving to more rural places. So there's going to be a kind of centripetal effect, I guess, as people just move steadily outwards. So Shetland, I think, might be a good option. <laughs> it's probably well, a little beyond the ripples. Who would have anticipated that? Yeah, things are changing all the time and changing so fast that it's uh, impossible to predict uh, yeah. what's going to unfold even tomorrow, let alone in a month's yes. time. So, yeah, yeah, feeling fluid at the moment feels like, feels like a, good. A, yeah, at a deep level, the right thing to be doing. Yeah. And the thing is, I think all of the spiritual paths tell us that it is impossible to predict, that uncertainty is the only certainty. Mm. And yet we manage to sell ourselves the fantasy that we can plan ahead and that everything will be as it was. Mm. And what's becoming clear now to everyone is that that's not true. Mm. I think possibly mm -hmm. accepting a, you know, a few core people in government who think they can cling to life as it was, but everybody else is realising that there is no normal to go back to, which hopefully, I hope, will will open up whole areas of possibility. So let's talk about those areas of possibility because following our first podcast, I wanted to look at the remaining books that you've written, which are The Game and The Trembling Warrior. Mm -hmm. And having explored both, as you and I have discussed, it may be that we end up doing a third podcast. But to begin with, we want to look at the metaphor of life as a game. So before we get into the metaphor explicitly, can you give us a bit of background as to how you came to write this and the context in which you came to have the ideas that seem to me really a very interesting structural metaphor for the times that we're going through now. But you wrote it three, four years ago? So when I was writing my first book, Hearing Our Calling, and researching that, I became of what felt like an increasing sense of control, dominance and harm. It felt like an energy that was rising and gaining strength. But what I also saw was, almost in response to that, humanity doing something beautiful, which was increasing creativity, collaboration, uh, spirituality, a new level of consciousness. And it felt to me, as I saw both of these increasing, that there was indeed a game playing out, or a dance, if you like, playing out here between those two forces, those two energies uh, and I don't mean to say that any individual is uh, on one side or the other. You know, I think the the lines, if you like, run through all of us and it's quite complex. Yes. But I wanted to convey this, what I could almost like foresee and these two themes emerging in a way that because it's so utterly and extremely complex, that would do its complexity service, but also explain it and articulate the things I felt it was so important to articulate. So I came up with the idea of the game. And this must have been around the time of Donald Trump's election, <laughs> I'm guessing. It was four years ago. It was ago. actually published on the day that he was confirmed as the next president, not by not by choice or design, but that's what happened. Wow. Because synchronicity is a thing. Yeah, Gosh, because it is. Okay. Certainly I have felt a similar sense that, that within myself there are the two warring sides. And there's the old um, story of the Native American grandfather telling his grandson about the two wolves and there's the wolf of compassion and the wolf of hate and they're constantly fighting and whichever wins is the one that you feed. Um, that's not quite the story, I'm sure. It, it's got a bit more depth to it than that, but that's the basis. Um, but you've become much more nuanced than that. So without dwelling on it too long, shall we look at a little bit of the 
energy of control, dominance and harm, because you split it into four interconnected but distinct sections. Shall we talk yeah, about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, there, I've split it again for the sake of simplicity, and it is more complex, but they are all interrelated. So first of all, dark media, hmm. which is the underbelly of all of the media, newspapers, the internet, advertising, everything that communicates on mass to people, um, but not with a benign intention or a creative intention purely, but rather rather with the intent to manipulate uh, people's behaviours. Yeah. And another is dark state. My gosh, so <laughs> now this has really become apparent. I was writing this in 2014, 15, but now dark state is so evident. The yes. aspect of governance, uh, of world leadership, that again is out to manipulate, to exploit, and seeks wealth and power and plays power games really and convinces people to uh, to go along with that and to support it. Yes. And often uses dark media as a tool in order to do that. I think let's go through the four and then let's talk about the ways that they interplay. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, sure. So another is dark corporation, also related. So dark corporation using advertising uh, primarily to convince people that they need a whole bunch of stuff they don't need by playing into insecurities and using very sophisticated psychology to drive a kind of extractive capitalism um, and also employing a whole load of people. You know, we talked last time about joyful work and bullshit jobs. And, yes. and dark corporation, of course, is um, is where most of the paid slavery is, um, putting money in other people's pockets. And the fourth is dark finance. So, again, this has become, you know, with the uh, Panama Papers, this really hit the public yes. awareness in a way that it probably hadn't done before, although we knew about the banks, we knew what happened in 2008 with financial collapse. But dark finance is the aspect, and to be honest, it's most of it, you know, big finance in the country of moving money around. So it's just abstract. It's no longer, is it, kind of pounds and pence, but it's abstract, huge sums of money being laundered, yes. um, people buying bad debt from each other. And uh, yeah, so all of those those four are very closely linked and uh, dark media publicizes them all and dark state kind of uh, sees to it that we all um, live our lives in a way that supports that system. So those are the, and it, yeah, of course it's more complex than that, but those are the four entities, if you like, the dark aspects of all of those institutions that I call the dark powers in the book. Yes, I remember memorably back in the 2008 crash, somebody described Goldman Sachs as the giant vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity. Yeah. And and it seems to me that these are these are kind of the limbs of the squid because there are there's a very free flowing revolving door between government and corporations and between finance and the media and and all four of them seem to me to be more openly connected than they were. But I'm not certain if that's simply because I have become more politically aware and I'm seeing that, whether they're being more blatant. I mean, we now live in a country with a government that is openly choosing to break the law rather than pretending that it isn't breaking the law, which up until now they have done. So they are perhaps being more open about it because because they can, because they own the media in ways they didn't possibly. I don't know. Is it your sense that the agglutination of these four is stronger than it was, or is it just that we're noticing it more? I think it's both. I think it's stronger and it's more overt. And my guess is that there's been a deliberate strategy. It may not have been entirely deliberate from the beginning, or it may have been, who knows. But there's a, there's mm. a strategy here, it seems to me, to become more and more outrageous, more and more blatantly corrupt. I think this has happened in other cultures, and it's been tested psychologically. And if people accept that yeah. and don't bat an eyelid yes. uh, at something like David Cameron and Piggate was a moment for me, it's like, oh, okay, so he can, you know, we can be outraged for a day or so. And some people can laugh about it and then he can just carry on doing his job. Everything had changed, I think, when we saw that. Yes. Although for me, that wasn't so much of a threshold as the MP's expenses scandal. Mm -hmm. Because that was uniformly in through the political class, total corruption. And and Cameron's was was just horrendous. But it it was one of those things that we kind of knew they did in the background. I suppose the corruption was too, is that 
we could we could demonstrate that every single one, pretty much, with a few notable exceptions, normally Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott and John McDonnell and Caroline were, Lucas and Caroline Lucas were using the system to enrich themselves illegally, and it caused a flurry for a couple of weeks. And they went, oh, nothing to see here, guys. And everybody looked the other way. Mm, mm, I just, mm. just totally gobsmacked by that. And this is where dark media and dark corporation have played a part in creating yes. creating a reality where that's just the norm. When you think about yes. some of the programming, you know, it's been, I want to use the word fashionable for the last few decades to show the dark side of life, to explore seediness. And it's almost become normalized. Mm. So there's been, it does feel like consciously or not, there's been a collusion in just normalizing this kind of behavior. Yes. And we grew up, I don't know about you, but I grew up thinking that the BBC was a beautiful, wonderful, glorious, balanced, even place full of good, decent people. And lately, I am realising the extent to which, if that was ever true, it isn't anymore. And there's a wonderful book by a man called Tom Mills, who's an academic who specialises in studying the BBC, and it's called BBC Myth of a Public Service. And I read that when I was doing the Masters at Schumacher and discovered the fact that I hadn't realised, which was that the BBC was instrumental in breaking the general strike of 1926. They wrote everything that was broadcast at that point and they brought the ministers in and told them what to say and how to say it and then broadcast it to the nation. So so the myth was always a myth, but I think, again, until this last election, I don't think they would have dared to have edited out a section in which one candidate for prime minister put the wreath at the cenotaph upside down, which apparently is considered completely and wholly unacceptable. And everybody thought it was Jeremy Corbyn and there was incandescent rage in newsrooms around the country. And then they discovered it was actually Boris Johnson who'd done it. And the BBC edited out that segment and edited in a bit from 2016 Mm. that looked better. Mm. It had a different coloured wreath, but hey, nobody was going to care about that. And that kind of level of utterly blatant manipulation of of an election, I don't think would have happened before. And yet they're still able to do it. You know, that yeah. was, um, I don't know how widely publicised that was or how many people knew about it. The BBC certainly didn't make it into news, obviously. No, <laughs> they, they apologised and said they were terribly sorry it was a mistake. Yeah. Which, you know, this is the kind of mistake <laughs> that involves somebody going into the archives, so spending many hours searching for the right bit mm-hmm. and editing it in, mm-hmm. in place of the other bit. It's quite a mistake. But but yeah, no, nobody yeah. chose to know. We all know that's not true. And uh, yes. well, and, and you and I know that's not true and a lot of other people do. Uh, and yet, I, again, it's more complex than the BBC, particularly BBC News, I think has been corrupt for quite a long time. Uh, using corrupt to mean uh, a tool of manipulation. Mm. And yet in the programming, I don't know about you, but I listen to Radio 4 quite often, and partly for the archers, which to me remains <laughs> remain pure. <laughs> but, really? um, but also oh. there's a lot of programming which... Uh, We might consider progressive programming. There are some wonderful things happening with Costing the Earth and um, various other documentaries and sometimes things on Women's Hour. So you can hear that there is a strong, and often people complain about the the BBC being too left-wing. So I think there's both. You know, I think there's a lot of good progressive programming going on. But um, where it matters in the news, I think, yeah, utterly, utterly manipulated. Yeah. And we don't want to turn into a conspiracy podcast. So... um, Yeah, let's not get too hard on that. I think one of the interesting things, particularly, obviously, is the rise of citizen media. Mm -hmm. So there are things like Byline Times, which recently took on a gentleman whose name I'm going to remember later, who used to write for The Observer and was then 17 years on Panorama and got sacked because for not being politically what they wanted. But he is now writing for Byline Times. And The internet has allowed the rise of John Sweeney, that's his name, things that might not otherwise have been possible, I think. And within, because within media, we have to look at Facebook and Google and Amazon and their role in, particularly in the political process, but in the shaping of the narrative of who we are and where we're going. And yet it has also allowed people like Tristan Harris, who used to work for the uh, ethics department of Google until he discovered that it really 
wasn't what he wanted it to be. And he left and he has now set up his own podcast called Your Undivided Attention, which I wholly recommend to anybody who's into podcasts. And if you're listening to this, you are into podcasts. The Undivided Attention is well worth listening to. So it is possible now, that thing that you said about creativity and collaboration and consciousness rising in balance does seem to me to be true. So within that, you created seven avatars of who we can be in any given moment and accepting that we flow between these, but that they give a level of self-awareness. If we can begin to become aware of what stance we're taking, then we gain that meta-awareness that is part of then having choice. So let's go through the seven avatars. Let's start with the manipulator, because that's the one that we've just been discussing most recently, I think, in terms of the media. It is, yeah. So the manipulator avatar is, uh, and I'm glad you said that all of these are ones that we can all play and do, that we flow through them. So we're not describing people here or even institutions. We're describing this avatar called the manipulator, which knows full well uh, the game that's being played, the uh, capitalist um, heist for power and money, and is one of the top players of that game, and will manipulate politics, will manipulate the media, will manipulate um, people and their work in order to extract from them whatever it is it needs uh, to gain power and control. Hmm. And so when people are in the grip of this, I'm curious from a kind of spiritual energetic sense of how many of the people, when they take on the manipulator avatar, know consciously that that's what they're doing and how many of them think that what they're doing is for the greater good of humanity and the planet. Have you any sense of the divisions there? I wonder, from where we stand, it, I'm, I'm often astonished that from where I stand, people can describe, for example, running the country as a business. I heard this described, and this wasn't by a manipulator avatar, but I heard somebody describing that as a good thing the other day. <laughs> and to me, that's astonishing. <laughs> but to the people who are running the country as a business, who I would yeah. see as manipulators in the harm that they're willing to cause in order to be uh, profitable or to <laughs> attempt to be profitable and effective, efficient, um, mm may think they're doing a good thing. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's, a compl it's a whole complex topic, isn't it? We could probably talk for an hour about what does we what could does spend an entire actually mean. Yeah. Yes, because there's the flip side of even having this discussion and putting it out. We are doing this possibly not to manipulate, but certainly to influence how people think and feel. The, the whole of the Accidental Gods Project is there to bring people towards conscious evolution. And that requires an awareness of where we are and what we're doing and a, a different vision of the world. And I, reading your book, I wondered whether at the points when I am most embodying the accidental God's thesis, is that a form of manipulation? And then, then we have to look in to what is the energy behind that? Mm -hmm. Maybe let's go through all seven avatars, because then I think there's quite an interesting discussion I'd like to have on on the energy and intent of what we're doing. But let's let's go through them. So we have the manipulator, who is the one who, for whatever reason, is aiming for power first. And I think because in our system, money and power are pretty much equivalent, that they're going for money as well. And presumably they're also going for hearts and minds because that gives them power. Is that fair? That's fair, yes. I think values are, I mean, we can come back to the discussion, as you said, later, but I think values are at the bottom of this and intent. Uh, why are we doing this? So, yeah, we, yes. and consciously or unconsciously is a big factor too. Yes. Yeah, so the next avatar is the cynic, and there's a bit of an overlap with the manipulator, because the cynic knows full well what harm is being done in the world and yet goes along with it because they see opportunities for themselves. So this may sound, this does sound similar to the manipulator, but the cynic is generally carrying out, is, isn't such a big player as the manipulator. The cynic is, if you like, carrying out the work of the manipulators. So right. might be instructing police to arrest peaceful protesters 
or, <laughs> for example, might or might be overseeing an intensive factory farm where certain animal welfare practices are removed, but to keep the tar- you know, keep the targets met or keep efficiency high is willing to go along with that. So basically, the cynic is um, c- cynical, as the name suggests. So not really believing in or. Uh, caring about values in the way that um, some of the other avatars are doing, but rather willing to, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but the ones who are willing to sell their granny. Right. And they're doing it again for personal advancement, but not. A, is the manipulator then more of a believer, do you think? And the cynic isn't a believer, is more agnostic, but can see, is, is riding the coattails as a way of enriching themselves. Riding the coattails. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking of the conversations that I have with our local MP and my feeling that that's it exactly. He doesn't really believe in what the administration of the governance is doing. But on the other hand, he's not going to raise a fuss because because he has effectively got a promise of I don't know, the chairmanship of various boards when he retires, if he keeps his mouth shut and keeps voting the way he's told to vote. Exactly that. Yeah. Okay. So that's, we've got the manipulation, the cynic. What comes next? So next comes the traditionalist. And uh, the traditionalist avatar, you have got rather a soft spot for. Um, it's a traditionalist avatar is a kind of a stiff upper lip avatar. So when we're clinging to what we know, we were talking earlier about the illusion of certainty. My goodness, that's really important yes. to the traditionalist avatar. We're in that, when we're in that one, we're clinging to an idea of whether it's a political party or the paper we read or uh, the soft furnishings that we have for our house. It's like, well, the right way, there's a right way of doing things. And as long as we just stick to that, then we'll be fine. And is it age related? Is it that all traditionalists are over the age of, let's say, five decades because they've had that long? Or are there youthful traditionalists too, do you think? I think it's more of a, of a personality trait. I think So I think okay. that what's happened, we talked earlier about the media and how social media has really made it possible to to acquire different norms. So I think people People, on the whole, are a lot more nuanced in their thinking and their approaches to things, and also able to kind of cut through the bullshit better um, in the younger generation who are more social media savvy and get their news mm. from different sources than the establishment. I think there's right. something, and we talked last time about generational things, and I think there possibly is something coming out of the post-war time where it was very comforting to have adverts that sold you an idea of very safe and uh, stable life and a government yeah. who said that as long as you just you know did what you were told and went to work or you were a good housewife, then everything would be fine. So yeah, I think both. I think there's something generational about it. And there are certain personality traits which lead people to to want and to seek and to feel comfortable with certainty rather than uncertainty. And I'm thinking, because the tendency, certainly my tendency, is to assume that these are readers of the Daily Mail and the Telegraph in the UK and and whatever their equivalents are in other nations around the world. But I've also sat on the streets of London with people in Extinction Rebellion who seem to me also to be traditionalists Mm -hmm. in terms of this is traditionally how we rebel, or this is traditionally how we are activist, or this is traditionally how we believe the government is. And it's got a similar sense of, I want the world to be coherent and constructed in a particular way. Uh And, And I'm not, I don't have the resilience to step outside of that. Is that your experience also, that there are traditionalists on, on all aspects of the kind of political multifaceted diamond. Oh yeah, there are yeah there are traditionalist activists too. Uh, it is uh, it's probably a residue of childhood. You know, when we were very small, uh, we made sense of our world by splitting it into good and bad, and splitting it into compartments that helped us to make sense of it. And right. something about resourcefulness or courage, or I think sometimes it's so hardwired that people find it incredibly hard to step out of that and to imagine, you know, everything that they believed or uh, values that value sets that they held might be shaken up and disrupted feels potentially catastrophic uh, for some people, yeah. and uh, they just don't get dare to to go there. And I'm noticing that I'm using, and we're both using the word they. So I just want to own the traditionalist part of that's myself we. as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who sometimes, you know, the traditionalist part of myself gets challenged when I have my very fixed 
opinions example for about some of the uh, the places I've been staying and uh, what the people might be like who live in some of these houses and have been proven right. completely wrong in all directions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, and and my sort of internal panic at the idea of of changing my home every every once in a while and not even knowing when that's going to be and and the unpredictability of it so i definitely have that kind of bricks and mortar around me as a requirement for my internal emotional stability um and and who knows how long that stability will last to be honest so yes you're right in very we need fast to changing it. times i'm a i would say i'm a traditionalist where uh, technology is concerned so I find it quite hard to adapt and keep up with a lot of technology. And so uh, I find myself almost moralizing, you know, kind of um, pre-technology time, which is, I know it's ludicrous, but that's my inner traditionalist. <laughs> a whole 20 years ago, the world was so much better. Um, yes, but you're the one who fixed our issue with Zencaster. So there we go. Um, so then we go on to the sleepwalker, I think, is is the kind of midpoint in our balance of the seven. That's so. Right. Yeah, the sleepwalker. Is, as I was reading this, you know, I was dipping back into the game again, preparing for our conversation today, and I realised just how many people have moved out almost by necessity uh, from the sleepwalker yeah. avatar. Loads and loads of people were in this avatar when I started writing the book. And it was mine and many other activists' frustration that we would keep shouting out about the corruption, environmental damage, social inequality. Most people just didn't want to hear it and uh, had mm. really were kind of seduced by the idea that everything was fine. And as long as we just went shopping and socialized and got drunk and things, everything would be hunky-dory. <laughs> mm. And so I've, my, and I think we all have this, we can all kind of sleepwalk in certain areas, just not being aware of the story behind an item we might buy or the corruption in a particular industry. Um, something that we might think is fine and isn't, you know, it's almost like layers being peeled away. And I think the last few years have just ripped off the layers for so many people. And we've been confronted with, with the shocking reality of um, impending climate crisis and, uh, and, and um, political corruption and so on. Uh, and um, coming out of this sleepwalker avatar that we were also seduced into, I think, during the 80s, is giving up people an opportunity to, as we said earlier, you know, to do something creative and to respond. So really coming out of Sleepwalker, we have the choice to yes. to jump either way. Are we going to be, or are we going to maybe cling on and be traditionalist and say, no, nothing's happening. It's all still fine um, in my valley here. <laughs> yeah. Or are we going to jump one way and say, well, the world's going to hell in a handcart. I might as well just play cynic and get what I can from it. Mm. Or are we going to, as I see so many people doing, say, right, okay, I can't be in Sleepwalker anymore. It's not an option. I can't unknow what I know. Therefore, I'm going to um, commit myself to, to some degree or other to doing what I can about this. Yeah. And then it's up to us to find out what to do. Because, yes, you're right. So many more people are choosing to change. I still come up occasionally against people for whom sleepwalking is a choice i think or i think then we come on to the avoider avatar they've seen because it does strike me that the pandemic it, it was very hard to sleepwalk through the pandemic you could not pretend business was usual at all and so then people had to change and i'm wondering if the manipulators were so desperate to get us all back to work to get us all back to buying our sandwiches from pret a manger and eating out at mcdonald's again and all of the things that they seemed desperately to want to happen. We're going to fund the airline businesses so you can keep taking a week's holiday in Spain, um, all of which is sleepwalking behaviour. And it's just not happening. But they needed us back in the sleepwalk because otherwise we might look at the bullshit jobs that the late, very great David Graeber wrote about or any of those things. Does that seem like a reasonable assessment to you? Oh, yeah. That they were trying to push us back into sleepwalking. Oh yeah, absolutely. Go out and shop for the country and eat for the country and <sighs> it's, it's um, uh, what is it? Bread and games, um, basically. Yes, bread and circuses. Bread and circuses, yes. yeah, exactly yes. that. So, From Nero, uh, yes. Yeah, and keep people happy, um, keep them entertained, keep them fed, um, but give them, yeah. it's a little bit like, when you think about it, it's a little bit like industrial factory farming. Give them the minimum they need mm. to live um, yes. 
and, uh, and and assure them that that's all they need, that that's fine. Yes, just the right side of, of actually dying. I When I was a veterinary student, we were told that, that Danish factory farms for pigs had discovered the level at which pigs would actually just die. Mm. And then they le- levered them as, as small an amount above that as they could to keep them alive long enough mm-hmm. to kill them, to eat them, mm-hmm. which was the point where I stopped, just stopped. Because because that's, I, I, I mean, I guess that's cynics and manipulators working together, but the fact that anybody could do that. Yeah, well, I would suggest that the cynics, for example, people are playing cynic adver- um, avatar when they're coming up with the science, when they're willing to mm. take their salary to come up with the science that tells you at what level you can just keep a pig alive. Um, yes. And the manipulators are the ones who are going to be making themselves extremely rich from an industry that uh, yeah. that profits from so much suffering. And the sleepwalkers mm-hmm. are going to be the people who trustingly walk down the supermarket aisle and pick up a lovely packet of bacon with a picture of a smiling pig on the front. Yes, yes. And cheap. And, you know, this this week's deal is, is much, much cheaper than yeah. last week's deal. Yeah, uh-huh. And for some people, there isn't a choice about that. You know, I think it's important to yes. be real about, or they feel there isn't a choice. You know, it's like for some people feel, feel that they can't spend the extra, I don't know, 50 pence. Some people can't. You know, food food banks are massively on the rise. I remember, I, I don't listen to Radio 4 anymore is because I couldn't bear it. But <laughs> overhearing it, I must have been in somebody else's house. And it was a program where the interviewer was talking to a young man who just walked an astonishing, like half a day to get to the food bank, and he hadn't eaten in almost a week. Yeah. And and the interviewer was in tears, and and yet nothing changed. You know, this was three or four years ago, and so we are we live in a situation where the the cheap food is the empty food that is utterly addictive, and yet has virtually no nutritional qualities and is damaging our health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the food that actually would give us nutrition is priced beyond the reach of the people who either have the bullshit jobs or who have no jobs at all. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm talking to you <laughs> as if this is your responsibility, and it so <laughs> completely isn't. I, I'm just gobsmacked that, that the dark media manages to then blame the people coming in on inflatable rafts mm. for this situation mm-hmm. rather than the people running their newspapers who are profiting from it. Yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> let's let's look at the next one on the list, which is the avoider, which I think now there are more avoiders than sleepwalkers, I, I would suggest. Yeah, I think so too. I think people have like, jumped into various avatars and I think avoider is one that a lot of people are probably currently jumping into. You know, we're talking about the BBC. I didn't watch it because I couldn't, but apparently last night yeah. there was a documentary, a David Attenborough documentary about oh, extinction. extinction. Yeah. yeah. So no, when people I didn't watch know. that and they kind of already know because for the last few years it's in people's awareness and you can't pretend this isn't happening anymore. But faced with something stark like that, I'm what are your options? You know, psychologically, you can either turn it into, you can either just suppress it and pretend that you didn't see it, um, but at mm. some level internally, of course, you did, and your soul knows that. Or you turn it, turn it into that, you know, that grief and that uh, fear into energy and do something as creative as you can with it. Whatever we can talk about that later. Or yeah. do you just kind of? Do the kind of, you know, put your hands over your eyes, put your fingers in your ears and just kind of keep pretending that, yes, I know this and it might keep me awake at night and it might bring me to tears, but I still feel unable to change my behaviours for various reasons that I describe in the book. And there are several of people feel too invested in their current life or their current belief system to actually acknowledge that, you know, the system's totally fucked. Or they don't feel empowered to do anything. Uh-huh. I think, I think, yes, yes, you're right. I think there's a lot of investment. I was really surprised last week, the um, Citizens Assembly finally reported the one that was brought together by various committees of the House of Commons. So this mm-hmm. is in the UK, a Citizens Assembly looking at climate change specifically. And it came up with a number of what to me seemed staringly obvious and very mild. It's like, God, you you met for a total of 6,000 hours and this is the best you could do. But leaving that aside, one of them was stop the sale of SUVs. 
And I put that up on my Facebook wall. And within minutes, because I have quite a lot of horsey people on my Facebook wall, there was a flame war going on about how dare you suggest. I live in a remote con- part of the country with my horses. I am not giving up my SUV. And the conversation became, actually, I think you've got a four by four. SUVs are things that you can pack seven kids in for people who actually only have two and drive around cities. I think you probably have you know, a discovery or something. It's not an SUV. But even did you have an SUV, <laughs> what you are saying is. So that, that's one of the, you know, holding on to, uh, well, whether it's an SUV or whatever it yes, is, quite. you know, that yes, kind of holding not, on to that level it, of well-being or luxury is one of the kind of motivations for being an avoider. And as you suggested, overwhelm, just the sense of yeah. this is all so so immense, so terrifying, so heartbreaking that uh, I just can't bear to look at it. And so I'll carry yes. on doing what I normally do um, and just just hope that it goes away or that somebody will sort it out or that it's not Somebody will sort it out. The technology true. will sort it out. Yeah. And the other conversation I found myself having a lot last week was it's it's all the fault of the population. There's far too many people. And until the population drops, there is nothing that can possibly happen, which is a very interesting it's somebody else's problem because all of the people having this conversation were beyond childbearing age. So they've had their kids. Mm. Therefore, you know, what's done is done. They can't be asked not to have them. And and God forbid that you should suggest that there would be a limit on how many children people have. But that's a separate question because it's not a question of human population. I genuinely don't think that our problem is the number of people. It's the consumption that attends a particular subset of those people. But it's a very interesting way of going, yes, there's a problem. Yes, I care about it deeply, but I'm terribly sorry. There's nothing that I personally can do to make a difference. And so it seems to me that we ha- have to see those parts in ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, again, this is I, I only find that deeply, deeply distressing because it must be triggering a part that I recognize and don't like inside myself. And then what do I do about that is to try and find ways to be empowered to actually make a difference. And Mickey Kashtan talked about the the central wounds of the patriarchy, one of which was powerlessness, separation, powerlessness and loss and our scarcity. And finding ways not to be powerless seems to me absolutely crucial because if we're looking at the world through the lens of this particular metaphor, then the dark four together are working very hard to foment that sense of powerlessness amongst the rest of us. If we found that we were empowered, if we found that there were things that we could do, then their hold on power diminishes. And so It seems to me that the last two of our avatars are the ones who are the parts of ourselves where we begin to find the ways that we can find empowerment. So shall we look at at the the altruist, which is the next on your list? Yes, indeed. Yeah. And for me, this is humanity at its best in some respects when we're playing the altruist avatar. And no matter how many of us there are, if we're all playing the altruist avatar all the time, which is um, which is a dream, uh, maybe not an impossible dream, but it's a dream that we uh, there was no need to play the hero av- avatar, which we speak about at the end. But if we're all playing alt- altruist all the time, overpopulation wouldn't be a problem because we would be finding ways to live in the world that are uh, harmonious with one another and harmonious with uh, our ecosystems and all the other species we share this lovely planet with. So it's yeah. a kind of, it's a contributing avatar that's, con- when we're playing this, we're contributing to well-being, creativity, uh, and, and a mutual reciprocal kind of sense of uh, collaboration and enhancing one another's lives, you know, including all species, rather than detracting from or doing harm. Uh, and you mentioned population earlier, and I do think that, you know, along with consumption, it's a problem. But, you know, some, there's a boom and bust in populations of any species, you know, rabbits or lemmings or turtles <laughs> or whoever. Sometimes the population does get very big and it's not sustainable and then it just naturally shrinks again. And of course, no turtles or uh, lemmings are to blame for that. Um, they've simply responded to their context. And uh, in times of plenty, you know, they've had large families and the population has boomed. And then mm. something has caused it to bust. And maybe that's what we're seeing now. 
Uh, but nevertheless, you know, a, there is a kind of carrying capacity that the world has. It's a very rich and abundant world, absolutely full of resource, but it's just down to how it's distributed so incredibly and equally around the globe and between individuals at the moment. Whereas playing the altruist avatar, we're living in a reciprocal way that makes sure that everybody has enough. Because, you know, there is, there still is plenty uh, to go around and to feed and nurture everyone and every every being. Yeah. And part of the central wounding is that sense of scarcity, that narrative that we're given that there isn't enough and that we have to cling on to the little bits that we have because otherwise bad people out there are going to take them. And I wonder to what extent that is a tribal instinct that is part of our hard wiring and how much it's something that we can learn to overcome. Because clearly being tribal was part of, or certainly was my current understanding of the evolution of humanity to where we are now. It was our ability to cooperate within tribes and then later between tribes that were considered allies that gave us the edge that got us to where we are. And somehow we have to expand our sense of tribe to be the whole planet, humanity and the more than human world, the whole of the living planet of however we call Gaia or Pachamama or whatever else. Somehow we need to be able to expand that sense of selfhood so that there are no others. Mm, mm, mm. And I don't know how we do that. Well, I think we're doing it and we're being, as you rightly said, you know, the the dark four are doing all they can to prevent that happening. But when you look at Extinction Rebellion protests on the street, for example, and you see that lovely collaboration, creativity, energy, and you imagine that, you know, that aspect of Extinction Rebellion protests is uh, not only as showing how to do protests, but showing how communities could be and could live yes. together. Um, yes. it's, of course it's possible you know it's like yes, we have right. we've been had philosophers studying this for hundreds of, well thousands of years in terms of how we can live well and live with one another and so we have the um, consciousness if you like the level of consciousness within humanity but we have this and I don't know how this will play out but we also have this dark destructive force that uh, mm. that seems to be you know turning us as a species in on itself and um, and threatening its imminent demise potentially. So it really feels to me like, you know, these kind of two forces that I speak about, that they're, it's all kind of come to a bit of a head at the moment. These things that have all been rapidly accelerating in the last few years, we now find ourselves really kind of poised and balanced in terms of two possible, well, I mean, many possible futures, but broadly mm -hmm. speaking, a future where we manage to transcend the harm we've been doing ourselves and each other and the rest of the living world uh, and manage to live harmoniously and uh, and a future where we don't do that, where the future looks a lot bleaker and possibly doesn't include humans and lots of other species. So there's really, there's everything to play for. There is, which is where we get to our final avatar of the hero avatar, which uh, watching the the feeds of... Extinction Rebellion these last couple of weeks, I have just been so struck by the courage, the absolute raw courage of of most of these actions. So let's talk a little bit about the hero. Uh, so the hero avatar, yeah. And this is the one that I said that if everybody was playing the altruist avatar all the time, there would be no need for the hero avatar. Because the hero avatar is the one that uh, is prepared to speak truth to power, is to confront the dark four, if you like, to risk arrest, to start a risky new venture. So it might be some high profile uh, activity like dangling from a crane somewhere or going on hunger strike. But, you know, it doesn't have to be that. When somebody walks away from their mainstream job because it's they know that it's uh, harming human souls or environment or other species or whatever and starts up or takes a risk and starts up a new venture that will create something mm. more positive in the world well they're playing the hero avatar yes. and even when somebody is in a group of people and there's a kind of a collusion around the elephant in the room like you know everybody's kind of I don't know laughing about uh, their SUVs or something else that it becomes mm. a, a bit of a theme and somebody dares to be the one who actually speaks up and challenges the 
dominant paradigm and is prepared to throw in, you know, to be the first person to say, actually, I don't agree with, I can't do that anymore. I can't go along with that anymore. Uh, Even though they might be ridiculed or excluded in the moment, you know, there's a, there's, there are seeds that go out when people speak in that way that gradually, gradually shift consciousness to potentially to uh, the kind of consciousness we do need to, to go forward as a species. Yes. I'm reminded of a of a book that was current in the 80s called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Oh yeah. Um, which still seems it's it's not a bad kind of aphorism by which to live that sense of because the hero as I understand it in this framing one becomes a hero not in spite of the fear but almost because of the fear. It's being able to act in the face of fear that if we did these things and there was no fear then then it's not so much heroism as just following an obvious path. The heroism is, I am really quite afraid of what's, what I'm going, partly because I don't know where it's going to lead, but I'm going to do it anyway. Is, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's a great assessment. And that could be, as we've said, some very obviously, you know, it's obviously scary to, I don't know, join a direct action or blockading the road. Take off all your clothes in front of Parliament and stand <laughs> yeah, there with a coloured flare in your hand. It's, yeah. It really is... Um, just amazing. Yeah. And yeah. those are the very obvious kind of actions. It's like, okay, so this is obviously quite scary. And am I going to be brave enough to do it? Do I have enough people to stand with? Or can I, you know, sustain the kind of um, comments I might get at work or in my family? Those are kind of quite obvious ones, but others can feel less obviously scary, such as starting a new venture or, you know, in some mm. ways, if when people are following their dreams, as we talked about in the last podcast that I did with you, hearing our calling, when people are starting to edge towards what their souls really want to do and then yes. they, oh I can't because you know some kind of fear pops up and says oh you can't because this or you can't because yes. that and if they, that's the kind of fear that when people recognize that as a discomfort on the way to actually unfolding something fantastic that they need to pass through that becomes a whole different story to almost see it as a what's the word I'm looking for almost like a kind of uh, ritual uh, transforming yes, a rite of passage and that's exactly that a rite of passage to pass through the fear yes. of doing it and to yes. move forward into a new phase yeah Yes, because so often with the shamanic work that we do, people come and their core question is, I want to find my my heart's true path or or words to that effect. Mm. And they wait and they wait for absolute certainty. Mm. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we need to do on the way through is go, if you wait for absolute certainty, you will be dead before you get there because death is the only certainty. If you are prepared to take that empty handed leap into the void and go with it, then the world opens up in ways you could not possibly imagine. And this is this is this whole emergence from complexity. If we could imagine where we were going, it wouldn't be emergence from complexity. And that feels to me very much the energy that we need just now is we have no idea what the future holds, except that it cannot be iterations of the past. Mm. And, and that together we need to step into that place where we can expand. So I was just thinking how beautiful that is. And I was wondering how many of your participants, if when they really get that and get it at a deep level that, uh, oh, this is quite natural, you know, the fear that I'm feeling or the uncertainty yes. that I'm feeling and, and manage to reframe that, uh, you must see um, some amazing uh, realizations, transformations yes. taking place. Yes, absolute transformations. Yes, yes. And the ability to listen to that very small nudge that comes from inside and trust it and go with it in spite of absolute terror. Yeah. Yes, I've watched, there's there's not many, but the ones that do, watching the flowering that happens as a result is is what keeps me going. It's it's amazing. So we have, as I thought, pretty much (laughs) used up a podcast time and I think we will wait to talk about The Trembling Warrior another time. But what I would like to do with the last few minutes is explore, without moving into conspiracy theory territory, but a felt sense that I have that I'm not able to explore with many people, that outside of these avatars, which live within all of us, there are energetic forces at work. And I don't know whether I'm paranoid. I read read a paper recently um, describing what it called the Wentico, which is W-E-N-T-I-K-O. I I will share the paper on the show notes. Mm. Um, As 
as a virus. And this is a concept that was prevalent in certain of the first peoples of the Americas, the, the North American native tribes, that this virus would inhabit certain people and that if it wasn't contained and I think encouraged to leave in, in the way that we would do extractions in shamanic healing, then it would spread. And that that if it took over a critical mass within a group of people, then then it would basically hold sway. And that this is equivalent to the four dark horses of the apocalypse that you are describing, um, all harnessed to it in a way. And the paper was exploring the ways we can see this within ourselves, because uh-huh. I think everybody who looks at this knows that the the kind of line between good and evil passes through every human heart. Uh-huh. And how can we make the change? And one last thing I would say that one of the elders in the group that I that meets occasionally said that his native teachers had said, this is the decade that really matters. And that at some point, everything will come down to a balance point where the weight of one heart on one side or the other will make a difference. And in a way, I find myself really pushing against that because I it feels very judgmental. It, it feels like some of the old Christian teachings from my past. If you know, everybody will be judged the weight of a feather on one side of the scale, and I don't like the idea of being judged at all. And yet, it does feel to me as if there is that pull towards wanting to manipulate, wanting or, or being cynical or just thinking, oh, heck, there's nothing I can do. Let's just immerse ourselves in hedonism, you know, the, the last days of the Reich as, as the armies move into Berlin um, of it's all pointless. So, you know, eat, drink and let's be merry. And and on the other side is the part that goes, no, there is still hope. There must still be hope, and we are being given so much help, and I choose not to believe that we are being given help in order to collapse into this. And yet, it feels like the the dark side is so much more powerful at times that it's really hard to feel that there's any possibility. So I just want to open up that kind of series of doors with somebody who gets it and see where it takes us. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there's some, th- oh gosh, there's so much in what you're saying there. It's, it's very rich. And there's something about, the, yes, the dark forces are so very powerful. And for me, it's not so much about going into battle and opposition, although that is an element of what needs to happen. But rather I see, uh, we spoke about the next generation and some of the wonderful things happening there. And rather, I see it almost like there's a game where you kind of jump over somebody else's pieces and they change color as you jump over them. Hmm. <laughs> I kind of imagine it more like that than a kind of face to face combat. So, uh, yeah, of course, there's hope. And of course, there is a possibility still of um, an even more beautiful future than we can imagine to very loosely use Charles Eisenstein's uh, words. Um, And I wonder what happens. You spoke very eloquently about the judgment and the Christian teachings, which I grew up with too. Um, But I wonder what happens if we take out the judgment that became such uh, a a manipulating aspect, if you like, of religion, you know, using that judgment to control people's behaviors. And it's very difficult to take it out because, you know, we grew up with it and as a culture, it's deeply embedded. But if we can manage to step back from the judgment and say, perhaps it is just true that what will make the difference is one person's action. We don't know who that person will be. We don't know what they'll do. Uh, and carrying it lightly, just to say, so perhaps that's true. Then you know there need be no judgment on me. I can I can live as I live and uh, do my. Um, I was going to say poor best. That's not really true. Do my do my good and imperfect best, <laughs> yeah. and know that it might be my action that tips the scales. It might be yours. It might be somebody who isn't born yet, or somebody who's who's about to die. And it may be mm. that that's a metaphor. Actually, you know, it's like the. Uh, the themes of uh, the the dark four, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and the 
the theme of the light and the dark and the theme of the feather, you know, they're all in some ways allegorical, don't you think? As uh, maybe they're not quite literal because it is so much more complex than that, but uh, they yes. are again just uh, ways to describe the dance and the this, this epic time, actually. And let's not make a mistake about that. We're in epic, legendary times. Uh, and they're a way of um, thematizing and just uh, describing what's actually, you know, the complexity of what's happening. Yeah, it does. When I'm getting really tired, which seems to be happening quite a lot lately, mm. it does keep me think, feeling that rather than just curl up and go to sleep, I could meditate a bit more. I could, I could be doing something to be doing the work on myself that eases me, it eases that line in my heart a little bit more fluid, a bit, a little bit more flexible. And my, my current work is, is definitely on understanding that if I cannot find total compassion for the people that onto which I project all of the manipulator stuff, mm -hmm. then I may as well give up, frankly. Um, and that's hard. But it, I suppose it, I find it useful as a metaphor because it stops me sinking into in action and despair because I would rather be acting and feel that I have some agency and that that my current agency is definitely that ability to expand the circle of my compassion wider and more true. What I'm really discovering recently is there's a way of thinking about feeling compassion and there's a way of actually doing it. That difference between declarative and performative is, is huge in my understanding at the moment. So, um, So yes, I hear you. I will go away and think about that and see where it takes us. So I think if you're up for it, we will definitely come back for a look at The Trembling Warrior because I think that is an extraordinarily rich dive into the altruist hero avatars together in a way. Um, and I'd really like to do that, partly to give everybody more of a an uplift than perhaps I have managed to do today. So we'll do that at some point. But in the meantime, thank you so very much for coming back onto the Accidental Gods podcast. Oh, thank you. So that's it for another week. Huge thanks to Jill for her courage and the depth and the warmth of her insights. Her books are all available through her website, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. We will have a third discussion about the last of her books, or at least the most recent, which is called The Trembling Warrior. We'll do that sometime in October. But if you want to read it in advance, she has released an updated version of it as a series of blogs on her website. So we'll be back next week with another conversation. And if you have any ideas of people you would like to hear on the podcast, please do get in touch. You will find me at Manda, with an M, at Accidental Gods. Dot life. In the meantime, thanks to Caro C for the music at the head and foot of the podcast and for the sound production. Thanks to Faith Tillery for being the other half of the creative team that is Accidental Gods and for designing the website. If you want to visit us there, we're at accidentalgods.life. You'll find the show notes, all the other podcasts, the visualizations and meditations in the resources section, and access to the Accidental Gods membership program, which is a structured training designed to give all of us the opportunity and the means to connect with the web of life in a way that yields answers to the deepest of questions. Because the answers are out there, and it is time that we stop thinking we had all the answers on our own. We don't have to and we don't need to. And letting go of that, for me, has been one of the most liberating realisations of the last few years. Just ask and learn to listen. That's all it takes. So if you know of anybody else who really wants to be active in creating that beautiful world that our hearts know is possible, do send them this link. And in the meantime, that is it for now. See you next week. Thank you, and goodbye.